15 years studying fiqh and usul al-fiqh with various scholars in the UK and he's been giving lectures in both the UK and more recently in Canada. He has a background itself in computer science and he currently lives in London, Ontario and operates the halal slaughterhouse called Bismillah Meats. I would like to invite Chef Mazin Abdul Azim to please speak to us on the way to belief. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So I hope everyone has learned at least one thing at some point in time today inshallah Has everyone learned a few things? Inshallah We thank Allah Azza wa Jal for guiding us to the truth Living in a world where there are millions upon millions and billions upon billions of ideas correct ones and incorrect ones, it is very difficult to sift through them. And the questions that arise, of course, that we must ask ourselves on a daily basis is how do we know that what we understand or what we believe in or what we follow is the correct one. It's a very dangerous forest to, to walk through for us human beings on a daily basis because it's very easy to fall into the pitfall of thinking that I'm right and everyone else is wrong without actually verifying anything. This is why Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, is it, do you not look around? Do you not think? Do you not question? You follow people before you. You follow other opinions without asking, without inquiring, without following rational thinking, without finding out and verifying at all times whether or not what you believe in is the correct thing. Many of us were born into Islam. How do we know that this is the truth? Many other people were born into other religions. It all has to be verified. How many people here, with a show of hands, get into, has gone into at least one discussion with an atheist at some point in time? Show of hands. Alhamdulillah, that's very good. How many people here, show of hands, regularly get into discussions with atheists? A little bit less. But this is the thing Allah Azza mentions in the Quran. You are the best nation brought forth to humanity. Why? Because of things like this. Because you call to the good. How many other religions out there, think about this actually, I only know of two, that actually actively go out and call people to their beliefs because of wanting good for the rest of people. Islam and Christianity. And Allah Azza, Allah Azza says that the Christians are the closest people in mercy and in kindness to the, to the Muslims. So the thing is about Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that we are da'wah carriers. We are people who call to the truth. But how can we call to the truth without first verifying our details, understanding it ourselves, and then taking it to others? One of the regular, I've gone into many discussions, hundreds and possibly even thousands of discussions with atheists. I spent a lot of time on the internet and also in person. I've uh, obviously traveled and I've met a lot of people who have come to me with a lot of different ideas. Uh, there's some obviously famous people out there, Dawkins and, and others, who have said you know, their arguments against believing in anything. One of the more common, or the most common, in my opinion, points that are brought forward by atheists is, number one, you can't possibly prove the existence of a creator. It's not possible. You can't detect him. You go back to the Big Bang, we don't know what happened before that. What happened when there was absolutely nothing? Can matter come out of nothing? Maybe. It's possible. Professor Cross recently said, there's a possibility that matter can come out of absolutely nothing. So, let's, so I want to analyze this one particular claim today. And the second claim that follows this is that if, when I tell them that Islam can be proven absolutely 100% with certainty, the same as you can prove the laws of physics. It's the exact same process. Very similar. And when I say this, they'll say that, well, you know, after some discussion, they'll say, if, okay, well, if you can if you can really prove this, the whole world would believe. I'll believe. Everyone. Why doesn't everyone believe if you actually have proof? It's a fair question. So let's go to that first one. Is it true that just because you can prove something, 
absolutely 100% with 100% certainty that everyone will believe it. Has anybody here seen that show called Hoarders? Yeah, lots of people seen Hoarders. Yeah, my wife watches Hoarders. So, it's interesting about the show Hoarders. There's a condition that actually only exists in certain parts of the world. I'm sure some of you will figure out what parts of the world. And it's interesting about this show Hoarders is that these are people who have this disorder where they can't let go of physical belongings. Their house becomes filled with garbage and excrement and dead animals and uh, pictures and so like the clean stuff, the dirty stuff, they'll open up the stuff and they'll move stuff and they'll find dead rats and feces, bathrooms, toilets that haven't been flushed in years. And the show goes on and shows this person's condition and they and everyone gathers and in the end, in, in, at some point in time in the show they have an intervention. So everyone sits down with this person and tries to prove to this person you are a hoarder and this is, this is messed up. You have a condition and we want to fix this. The hardest part is getting past the denial. Not the, the cleanup, of course, is a, is a big issue too. They have to let go of their emotion. That's another thing. That's the next step. The first step is just admitting that they are a hoarder. What about alcoholics? The guy drinks three bottles of whiskey every single day. He drinks while he's alone, while he's walking. At all times, he has to be drunk, and he'll go nuts if he doesn't get drunk. You go up to this person, you tell him, you are an alcoholic. What's the first step? Deny it. We all know these stories. Just because you can prove to him, look at how much you drank today. Look at that wall of, of bottles that you drank today. Just because you can point it out and prove to him that he is, in fact, an alcoholic, doesn't mean that he's going to accept it. The same thing with racism. With racism, how many people have been killed due to racism? How many people have been beaten up due to racism? Let's look, let's look at the white-black racism that happened in America when, the ensla when, the, when the slavery happened. If you go up to a racist and you tell him, and you explain to him the nature of the human design, you explain to him the nature of the human design, and you tell him that there's nothing different about a black man from a white man. There's nothing different. It's just the color. You did not even earn your white skin. You did nothing to earn this skin. You were just given it. If you look at it as a higher, a higher skin color, you did, you did nothing to get it. It was just handed to you by your creator. You prove this person through biological evidence, through rational analysis of a daily life of a person who's white or black or brown or Asian or whatever else it may be. You show him there's no difference between these colors. Will the person immediately accept it? The answer is no. Because it's a choice. Just because you can prove something doesn't mean that the person is automatically going to accept it. It's a choice. And belief in anything is a choice, even though it can be, you can reach absolute certainty with it. The reason why it's a difficult choice is because there are implications to belief. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to change your friends. You have to follow new rules. You have to change your financial situation, especially when it comes to religion, especially when it comes to Islam. You can't deal with interest anymore. What about the house that you have a mortgage on? What about the car that you have a lease on? What about all the debts that you have at the bank? What about your student loan? What about these things? What about now you have to start hanging out with a bunch of brown guys? What about all the things related to your dress? You have to start putting, you have to start covering your hair and you have to start covering your body. You can't remix with boys and girls anymore. All these things are lifestyle changes. This is a big decision. You have to now submit to something. You have to accept that you don't control your Allah, your, your destiny, your fate. You have to give in to this higher authority and look at yourself as being weak now. These things are not easy to accept. That's why belief is a choice. And that's the first point, that we, why you should understand what a person says, that just because you can prove it. The first thing, of course, is proving it. And the second thing is, is accepting it. So let's go to the proof. Before I start with the proof, I want to point out an interesting thing that, that, that is related to usul al aqidah And this is agreed upon by the classical schools of thought, which is that belief in something unproven to 100% certainty is actually haram. Belief in something unseen be, that is less than 100% absolutely certain is actually you're committing a sin if you do this. It's actually haram. Now this is not related to ahkam shar'i, 
such as fasting and praying and so on. We're talking about, for example, what happened in the cave. How many people were in the cave? The, the concept of belief requires some sort of leap of faith. Islam forbids it. Islam does not allow you to have faith in the root of Islam. You cannot just accept Islam just because someone told you. Although a lot of us do. And it doesn't mean that it's, there's anything wrong with your aqidah. But rather, Islam does not allow you to believe in things that are unseen, such as the details of Jannah and Jahannam, without knowing absolutely that the source of the story is verified. So everything in the Quran is already verified. Everything in Mutawatir Hadith is verified. We know these things. But for example, how many people were in the cave, as I mentioned in the example earlier? The Quran mentions this. It says that they talk about the numbers, 6 and 7, 7 and 8, it goes back and forth. And all they're doing is throwing stones in the dark. <laughs> Doubt has no place when it comes to the topic of truth. It has to be proven with certainty. And that's why the Islamic Aqidah is different from every single other Aqidah out there in the world right now. Every single other religion, every single other religion on the planet requires a leap of faith because it doesn't have proof to verify that this message is in fact from the Creator, whereas Islam is the only one, and I'll get into the course details, the only one that actually has proof. The one example people say is that, oh, look at all the religions, and oh, look at all the destruction, and look at all the hate, and look at what the Muslims are doing, and all the other ones are doing, and how do we know there's anything good in all of this? The example that I use is that if I were to give you a bag of glass, filled with shards of glass that will cut you if you touch them, and I throw a diamond in there, a very valuable diamond in there, and I shake it around, and I give it to you, and you stick your hand in there and you cut yourself, you stick your hand in there and you cut yourself, you stick your hand in there and you cut yourself, does that mean the diamond isn't in there? Just because the whole world is, is, is filled with ideas that are wrong, doesn't mean that the truth is actually not there. You just require effort, and that, by the way, is one of the most important things about the dunya. It's a testing ground. You can't just walk into Jannah. You have to go and analyze and think. Our physical body requires work if we want to go out and do work and physical labor, and our mind requires work if we want to find the truth. Do you think some of the greatest scientists in the world, the biggest inventors, whoever inventing the, some of the greatest technologies that we have right now, do you think they just sit around and spend five minutes a day thinking about what they're doing? They absorb themselves in their, in their work because they need to understand these things deeply. What about the meaning of life? Is not more important than every piece of technology on earth? That's not to diminish from the importance of technology and advancements in medicine, but this topic must be given its due. We look at the example of Abu Bakr, when they came to him and said that your companion says that he went all the way to Al Quds and came back in a single night and he also went up to heaven. What did Abu Bakr say? Did he say he said the truth? No. He said if he said it, then he had said the truth. We're not people who just blindly believe in everything that's thrown at us. And by the way, there are so many stories. I remember when The Matrix came out, the second one was about to come out, they, they, there was a rumor online that said that they have a character called Allah, and he's one of the evil characters in the movie. And everybody started sending out this email, getting upset about this character named Allah that was evil. And I sent an email back saying that, have you guys checked the website? Have you called Warner Brothers? Have you, before you spread this, have you verified the authenticity of this. This goes for every level, from the very root of the Aqidah to the very ends of Hakum Shari. Why are we discussing this? As I said, I want to go into one small aside. I hope I have enough time to go through all these details, because I have a lot of really fun stuff to talk about. <laughs> Why are we discussing this? I want to talk about something interesting. Let's say, because certainty, by the way, certainty is something that affects our actions. The more certain we become, the stronger our actions will be, and once we reach 100% certainty, our reactions will be natural. They will be exactly what they're supposed to be. So let me give you an example. If I were to say, and I'm gonna, I want you to really think with me right here. By the way, this talk, I really want everyone to really you know, put on your thinking caps. I want to go through some really deep details. I don't want to just talk about the shallow stuff. I want to get into some deep things here. If I were to tell you with this tone of voice, in this exact way, I were to tell you, there's a gas leak in this room, everybody. Get out of here, let's run. Why aren't you all reacting right now? Get out, come on, there's a gas leak. Because the tone of my voice indicates to you that certainty is very, very low. It's actually not even true. There's no gas leak in here. Your reaction physically is not going to match 
what I'm saying is actually happening. But hold on, let's say you saw in my tone of voice, I started getting an urgency. Urgency. I can, you see, you stop for a second. Complete stop. I smell, and all of a sudden I can smell, and I all of a sudden start looking like I'm panicked. You might think I'm maybe, okay, I'm smelling things, maybe I'm a little crazy. What if you start smelling it? I'm saying now you're sensing the, the, the reality. You're starting to smell the gas, and let's say this, the gas smell gets really strong, and you start hearing a hissing sound. Your second sense kicks in. You smell it, and you hear it. And then all of a sudden you hear a commotion, everybody starts, and then the organizers come in here. May Allah protect us all. And they come in here and they start, everyone starts yelling, so now everything is escalating. Now you'll notice your heart rate will rise. You'll start getting afraid. You'll stand up, and you'll get out of here. Because certainty has been reached, or at least near certainty. At this point, you're on 90%, 95%. Now the thing is, is, if you know for a fact, somehow, the place is about to explode, the sheer horror that will fill your heart will cause you to just stampede out of here. You may even be running over people. You may even forget who you are. That's how certainty works within us. So this is how the Islamic Aqidah works. Why were the Sahaba so terrified when, when Ali عن, when he used to do wudu? I think the, the previous speaker mentioned this. They used to shake. Why is it that Abu Bakr, when he used to go to the washroom, he would cover his head with a cloth? Out of the shiram, out of embarrassment in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he is going to the washroom. And he knows that Allah Azza wa Jal can see him. Why did the Sahaba react this way? Because they had reached certainty. When Ali, radiallahu when he, he said in a narration that if I were to wake up tomorrow on Yom Al-Qiyamah facing Allah Azza wa Jal, it would not increase my iman even in the slightest. Not even in the slightest. He is so certain that it's going to happen, he wakes up on Yom Al-Qiyamah and he knows exactly. The only thing we should all aspire to is that we should be, of course, shocked by the details of Yom Al-Qiyamah, but not surprised by the event. When we wake up on Yom Al-Qiyamah, when we end up in our grave, we should all be certain. We know. When it happens, we were expecting it. We knew it was going to happen. But if anyone, if anyone of us feels anything less than that level of certainty, that means we need to discuss this topic. This is why we are discussing this topic. We need to reach absolute certainty that Islam is in fact the actual final message from the creator of the universe. And also, we are Dawah carriers. And therefore we must carry this to people around us. This is how we are as a home. So let's talk about the two aspects of the Islamic Aqidah, the roots. One is the proof of the existence of the Creator Himself. And the second thing is the proof that the message that we have is from the Creator. These are two different topics. People often confuse the two. They think that you prove the Creator, you prove the Quran, or you prove the Quran, you prove the Creator, but they're mutually exclusive topics. You prove the Creator, it doesn't mean you've proven what message He sent. It could be any message out there. Then you need to prove the message. There are many ways of proving the existence of the Creator. The two primary ones, one is very strong and one is the strongest. The, strong, the one that is very strong is intelligent design. And I'll go into some details about that a little later. And then the second one, which is the strongest in my opinion, which is deductive reasoning. By looking at the nature of matter itself. So let me ask you all a question. Let's say you're walking around the desert. I don't know, you're bored one day and you're just wandering around the desert. You start digging. Actually, let's say you're an archaeologist and you're actually digging deep into the earth. You're digging and digging and digging, and all of a sudden you come across a piece of metal. So you start digging some more, until you open up the area and you pull out a sword. But this sword is deteriorated. It's broken down, it's rusted, it's cracked all over, but it's still, you can see it's a sword. It has a handle, it has a guard for the hand, and it has the blade, but it's all really rusted. It's, and it, again, it's, 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 it's about to fall apart. It's been in there for a long time. Would any one of you, at any moment of time, or would anyone on the planet that has ever existed, ever possibly think that this sword has been there forever? Of course not, but there's a reason for it. Of course, we think, well, you know, you know. The thing is, you can't say, I, I instinctually know, I magically know, I have some connection to the, to, the, to, the, to the energies of the universe, and I can tell that a sword, this sword in particular, has never been in existence. In existence for eternity, we know this is not the case. We know there's an actual rational thought process that our minds go through, although quick, very, very quick. But I want to break it down a little further. The reason why 
I'm going to jump. Usually I want you to answer this question when I'm discussing this, this thing. I want people to tell me what they believe why. But I, of course, it'll become a little confusing if everyone starts yelling at you. So the reason why you know that this sword is not, has not been there for an eternity is because the sword is deteriorating. That's one aspect of metal. We know this. Due to the fact that it's deteriorating, and eternity is longer than any amount of time that it takes. Let's say, let's say it takes a sword a hundred million years to deteriorate into dust. And eternity is longer than that. So if the sword has been there for an eternity, it would have become dust by now. If it takes the sun a hundred million trillion years for the, for the sun to burn out, could the sun have been there for an eternity? Of course not, because an eternity is longer than a hundred million billion years. I'm just making up numbers here. So the thing is we know, that's why we know the universe, by the way. That's why they go back to the Big Bang Theory. That's why there's all these different ideas about the evolution of the universe and so on. Is because we know that the universe had to have a starting point. The main thing that we have to note about all matter in this universe is that everything has this quality. Everything is like the sword. Everything is like the sun. We ourselves deteriorate over time. The mountains, the, the water on earth, everything is a system that's running and is deteriorating and it's constantly breaking down and it's weak and it's imperfect and it's dependent on other than itself. That is how the universe functions. It is a system that does not have the qualities that are required of something to exist eternally. It has to have a starting point. Every single piece of matter in this universe, and I want you all to think about this and understand this and verify this. Every single thing in the universe has one major quality that is the common denominator amongst every single one of them, and that is, it's limited. In that it's weak, it can break, and that it's incomplete. It grows and shrinks, it gets better, it improves, it, it, it falls apart, and it is dependent on other than itself. Everything needs something else. You need a certain level of moisture, you need gravity, you need a certain atmosphere, etc., etc. We have literally thousands, millions of variables that must be in place in order for us to even be alive. The entire universe is made of this matter. And that's how we know that the sum of all things that cannot be eternal is a unit that cannot be eternal. It's limited in its scope. Everything that is limited leads up and adds up to something that itself is limited. And therefore, we know the universe has a starting point. The question is, what comes before that starting point? What's interesting about this point, and a lot of times we miss this point. We understand the first part. And I feel like I've said a lot of things that you already know. But at this point, we skip a little point, and we forget about this one aspect. Is that the way that we know that the Creator is eternal is because He's not made of matter. He's not dependent on matter. He is not bound by any of the characteristics of matter because he created matter for other than him to exist. Matter proves in, in itself, in its intrinsic essence, that it has a starting point. Because that's when we look at matter, we realize it has to have a starting point. That proves to us that the creator does not have any of these qualities. He does not have any imperfections. He does not grow. He does not shrink. He does not learn. Knowledge is an aspect of a lazoid. Allah Azza is eternal, and that's why when people try to put the Creator into a material being, there's two things about this. One, it's because it's all we know. We as human beings, we've only been in the universe. We haven't been outside the universe. So how do we know what, what's the essence of Allah Azza wa There's no way of knowing, because we've only seen created matter. If you try to imagine Allah Azza wa you're going to imagine something material, because you've only ever seen something material. You're immediately insulting Allah Azza wa by trying to imagine. And once you make him into a, a, a physical object, like an idol or a human or anything else, you've insulted him. Because you've said that he requires this pathetic, little, weak, insignificant, broken body in order to exist, like we do. And he doesn't. He's eternal, and he created all things. So therefore, he has to have two qualities. One is that he's not bound by matter, and therefore he is eternal. And two, he has to be capable of bringing matter from non-existence into existence. He's able to create and design and obviously we can see, moving on to the second point, which is why, the reason why I say this is a strong topic and not the strongest, because it's really supplementary to 
the first topic, which is intelligent design. There are so many things, and I'm going to try to cut it short because I can just talk about this for about an hour or more. There's so many things about this universe that absolutely prove to certainty that it could not possibly have come from just, not just chance. I mean, of course, yes, people say that evolution happened by chance and all the universe happened by chance. But even through a, 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 a very wonderful chain of events, it's impossible. There's absolutely no way this universe could have come from just a wonderful chain of events that just happened to flow together due to the massive odds. And the reason why is because, and I'm not going to go into all the details, of course, but I'm going to go into a couple of them. One of the most interesting things is the magnetic sphere around the Earth. This is one of the things that really I, my attention is drawn to a lot whenever I see it online. You know the aurora borealis, the northern lights that we see, those beautiful lights that, that happen, the little green ones, and they kind of haze. You can even see them actually in, in Canada. I've seen them in Calgary. But if you go further north, you'll see lots more of it. What's interesting about this is the sun sends out, and anyone of you can go read this, and I think actually pretty much everybody here knows this. The sun shoots out these solar flares. These are massive amounts of energy and lots of, of, of uh, like heat and, and very damaging rays that are, that are sent towards the Earth. And the Earth just happens to have this little bubble around us that takes a solar flare and moves it around and sends it up to the poles and then cycles it through a cone and dissipates the energy. And that's we see these pretty lights. If this little bubble, called the magnetic sphere, did not exist on, around Earth, everything would die very, very quickly. We would, there's no way we would even, we, would there would even be a chance of us surviving. Why is there gravity? It just happens to exist, even though there's no reason for it to exist. Why do we breathe out what the trees breathe in, and the trees breathe in what we breathe out? Why? What connection do we have to trees? How is it that if we are evolved from a single cell organism that had no eyes, how did that little organism start detecting light in order to begin creating a mechanism to decode it? Saying that the eyeball can be designed before understanding what light is, is like designing a computer before electricity was ever invented. How would you even know how a computer would be put together if you don't even know how electricity functions? How can it be that this eyeball would just open up and start moving, and, and we have two, and it decodes light in, a, in the most, in the exact way that it's supposed to be decoded? Why wouldn't we have a sense of taste? Why would we have a sense of touch? Wouldn't we all die if the reason why we have a sense of taste is in order to, to detect poisonous things? Wouldn't have everything died before it would have ever figured out billions of years of evolution? There's lots of things that are impossible. Why do we have a floating water machine floating around the Earth? that just happens to keep everything alive. And nobody else, no other planet that we can see anywhere in the, in the universe has the same thing. We have clouds. It's a floating water machine. Without it, everything would die. There's so many things about intelligent design. This is an engineered planet. It's a designed planet. Look at your own bodies. Rafi and Pussy. In yourself. The design of your hand. Just the fact that you have a thumb. How many animals don't have thumbs and they can't do anything because of it? Have you ever seen your cat try to pick up a can, a tin of their food? It's not going to happen. They don't have a thumb to be able to grab it. This thumb is one of the keys to us being able to do things. And we have self-awareness. Why, why does nothing else on the planet have self-awareness? If we're evolved from, from primates, why is, why is there nothing even close to having self-awareness? Everything, even the most intelligent animals, all they can do is put one and one based on their hunger or very basic instinctual response. Whereas we can build buildings that is way beyond our instinctual, instinctual basics. We can build cars and airplanes and so on. We are absolutely, certainly designed by a designer. And there's so many things. Why would we split up into two genders when we're so much more efficient replicating from one single cell organism? There's so many things. And at what point in time did the system start bringing the two genders back together again? There's just so many things that just don't make sense. And that's why. It's a very simple answer. And I've heard people like Krauss and people like Dawkins, when you, add, when, you, when you bring up these points to them. And the response is, it's just too easy of an answer to say that the Creator exists. It's too easy of an answer. It just answers everything too quickly. We want to be able to think and look into the universe. And we tell them, you find the answer first, and then you see. Look at what Islam did for the world during his golden days. And I'm not, and of course, the golden days truly were the life of the Prophet Muhammad and the Khalifa al-Rashidin after him, and then the 
the early days of Islam, the Tabi'in, the Tabi'in, but there was also a golden time, to, a golden time in terms of prosperity and in terms of technology and education, and that was during the days of the of the of the um, Baghdad and, and the, that golden era of that time. So we find that Islam promotes rational thinking and intellectual thinking. It is a thinking person's religion. It is the actual answer for why we exist, and it's based on the mind. It promotes and tells you to always think and to always question and to always analyze. It's so important that we become leaders in, in every facet, in every aspect of intellectual discourse, whether technology or whether issues related to belief. But it's still a choice. You have to remember that. It's still a choice to believe in this. You can explain all these things to somebody, and they still won't accept it, even though it's so obvious. It's so clear and obvious, but it's still a choice. Just like an alcoholic has a choice, just like a racist has a choice, and just like a hoarder has a choice. That is the main, that's, that's the gist of the topic of the existence of the Creator. And that's how we know Allah Azawajal absolutely exists. He's absolutely listening in on this. He's absolutely here with us. He knows absolutely every single one of our intentions at every single moment of time. He knows the count of every single leaf on every single tree on earth, every single count of every single leaf that's floating in midair right now, and the count of every single leaf that has hit the ground and is sitting on the ground right now. He knows the details because he designed all of this. He's holding all of the molecules together. He's holding all the laws together. He's monitoring everything and running everything. We know this is a fact, and we know that we're going to him. But the question is, what does he want from us? Before I go into the message of Islam, and of course you all know the answer. Uh, I'm just going to go into the details of the answer that you already know. But I want to go into a couple of things. I want you to think about these things. You go up to a person, you prove to them the existence of the Creator. Okay, I know there's a Creator. Thank you, Creator, for all this fun stuff. I'm going to go and have fun now. Right? Why do we need a message? I mean, it says who? We need a message. You've got to prove that too before you jump. Say, no, 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 here's the message, here's the message. Why do we need a message? I'm going to keep it quick. Two points. Number one, when you look at the moon, and you look at the stars, and all the stuff that I've talked about, these amazing things that are designed by the Creator, it will cause a reaction with us. It's a spiritual reaction when we start to get deep, thinking about the Creator and recognizing His existence. This is for sure. The spiritual feeling is designed, it's a program by the way, it releases chemicals. This feeling is a chemical. This is a program designed within us by Allah Azza wa Jal to analyze this topic. Because if you didn't have this nice feeling, you wouldn't even bother with it. Do you feel like marrying that curtain over there? <laughs> Nobody wants to marry that curtain over there. And because you're not designed to have a drive to marry the curtain or marry that chair or sit here and take this podium home and eat it dinner. We're not designed to, that's why you're laughing of course, because these things are crazy. But the thing is, is that we are designed to seek a mate. We're designed to seek wealth. We're designed to, seek, to try to become stronger and defend ourselves. If you don't have any friends, you're going to feel a little sad. And if you don't worship Allah Azza wa Jal, if you don't worship something, if you don't sanctify something, you're going to have what they call that void inside. All those songs about the void inside, all the people who are drinking and smoking drugs and partying endlessly and trying to enjoy life and live the free life, the reason why they're doing this is because of that void. And it's not a magical void that can be filled in with magical stuff. It's a very simple thing. You're designed to seek friends, you're designed to seek love, you're designed to seek wealth, and you're also designed to seek sanctification of something something greater than you. That's why people often sanctify something along the way, idols and stars and, and I'm talking idols like famous people, famous people, and then physical idols, and then stars, and then energy around the universe, and then Jesus, and then Allah Azza wa Jal. He's the actual answer. That's the first thing. The reason why we need a message from this Creator is because we are designed to worship Him. How do we worship Him? How? Do I start a fire and start dancing around it? Do I take a virgin and slaughter her on a podium? Do I take a lamb and slaughter it on a podium? Do I go out and give money to poor people? Do I... What do I do exactly? I go sit down in front of the stars and howl at the moon? What exactly do I do to worship this Creator? Do I pray 150,000 times a day? Do I sacrifice all of my work and just worship the Creator day and night? I don't know how to worship Him. How, am I, how is any one of us supposed to know how to organize your relationship with the Creator of the universe? He is the one who tells us. And therefore, He doesn't have to give us a message. That's why Allah, Allah describes the Qur'an as a rahmah. 
Islam as a rahmah al-alameen. It's a mercy. He is merciful to us by giving us a message. He doesn't have to do anything for us. We need a message from him. That's the first reason. Second reason is we have life to live. Well, how do I organize my relationship with my friends and with my wife? Do I, should I even marry her? Should I have 500 girlfriends? Should I go steal or should I go work? And what kind of work can I do? How do I organize that? Everything, everything we know, we know we, we have societies and we know we have laws related to societies. We need guidance on how to best live our lives. There's no way for us to know. Look at what's happening to the world right now. Look what's happening to the world right now. Everyone is in misery because of this man-made law. Nobody knows what's legal and what's illegal. Everyone's making it up every year. Laws are changing constantly. Look, this is one interesting thing I found. They're, gonna, they're, they're looking at making marijuana illegal, and it's, it's happening. It's happening throughout the states now, and it's going to come into Canada. You just watch. It's going to happen. Give it another two, three years. So, marijuana is going to probably become legal in a few, uh, it is now legal in a few states, and it probably will become legal in a few provinces. Most likely Quebec first. Mark my words. <laughs> so, the thing is about marijuana is that, okay, so they've arrested all these people throughout the years for smoking marijuana, and then tomorrow it becomes legal. So what you're saying is, all that time you were wrong, and you persecuted all those innocent people, and now suddenly it's okay? This is the thing about man-made law. It just changes based on whims and desires. At one point in time, all the laws related to black people, we know what happened during the persecution of those people, and suddenly now it's all okay. And then homosexuality people were, were persecuted, and then now it's okay. Laws just change as time progresses. Give it another 10 years, and then they'll be marrying three-year-olds. How is, that, how is that a surprise? Ten, you know, about 40 years ago, homosexual, homosexual marriage was a crazy idea. It was, it'll never happen. In the 1920s, this was absurd. There's no way that they'll allow homosexual marriages and, and gay people will be on every single TV show. And if you even question this idea, you're an outcast and you're wrong and you're evil and you're oppressive, etc., etc., etc. So we need guidance. Guidance that is unchanging, that is objective. There's only one objective source of guidance and that is from the creator of all of man, because he designed us, he designed our programs, he designed our motives, our drives, he knows what's best for us. A VCR, ancient technology I know, does not come without an instruction manual. Everything that's complicated comes with an instruction manual. We are the most complicated thing in this universe. We need an instruction manual. How do we verify that this instruction manual that is coming from the Creator is really from the Creator. How do you know this? Let me give you an example. Let's say we're sitting around in a coffee shop, enjoying our, you know, brownies and cupcakes and drinking our tea. I'm a tea man, I don't like coffee that much. So we're sitting around and we're enjoying ourselves, and in bursts a wise man wearing a white thobe, big white beard, holding a tablet, yelling, I have come to you with a warner from your Lord. I am the messenger of God and I have your message. Let's say, okay, let's go back 10,000 years, okay, so it's not as crazy. 10,000 years, this time hasn't come yet, we're all sitting around in a field somewhere, and a guy runs up to us and says this to us. Are you going to believe him? Whether you answered yes or no, or maybe, or I don't know, and I'm confused, the interesting thing about this is that if you were to take a step away for a second and ask yourself, what does this man have to have? Because he could be saying the truth. What if he's Musa, alayhi said? coming to you and telling you, send Bani Israel with me. What if he's Isa and I'm coming to you and saying that I am a messenger from Allah? What if like in Surah Yasin, if Allah, if Allah Azza wa Jalla sent two prophets and then he made him strong with three and they said that Ar-Rahman did not send anything. وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَنُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَكْذِبُونَ Ar-Rahman, they called him Ar-Rahman, they called Allah, they called Allah Azza wa Jal, the most merciful. The most merciful Ar-Rahman did not say anything, you people are liars. How do we verify a liar from somebody who's saying the truth? There's only one way, only one way. The person who's coming with this message has to have something that no human being could ever do in those same circumstances, ever. It has to be impossible. That's the definition of a miracle. I'm not talking about an Oprah miracle where you lose 20 pounds and you go run around the block in a bikini. I'm talking about an actual miracle where you break the laws of physics. It's impossible for you to take a stick and jam it into the ground and the Red Sea opens for you. It's impossible. You can't go up to a person with leprosy and touch his face and instantly he heals. I mean, we know this, you know, let's say you have a cure for it. It takes time. You can't just instantly cure something like this. 
You can't take a dead person who's been dead for a couple of years and just walks out of the ground, alive and well. It's impossible. The person who comes with the message, first of all, has to have a miracle. Something from Allah Azza wa Jal that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. The second thing is, if this message has been around for a couple of thousand years, a second thing must exist, which is a way of verifying that nothing has been changed in this message. Not most likely, not most of it. We have to have a way of knowing absolutely nothing can change in this message. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal sent messenger after messenger after messenger Rasulullah Rasulullah said that the, the children of Israel used to have their affairs managed by the prophets. Every time one died, another one came after it. But there won't be anyone after me, there will be khulafa. And they will rule according to, of course, a ruling, they will rule according to the Quran and Sunnah. So in order to verify a message, we have to have a miracle, and we have to have a way of verifying the authenticity of the book after thousands of years. Allah Azza wa Jal solved both of those problems in one thing, which is the Qur'an. The linguistic structure of the Qur'an is something extremely easy to understand, extremely easy to memorize. You'll often be reading it, and it's happened so many times. I'll have an audio recording, and it's happened, I remember, after a couple of months of listening to an audio recording, suddenly I'd memorize the chapter. That's how easy it is to memorize the Qur'an. Think of any other book. You can't just memorize word for word. The Qur'an is. The Qur'an is a very interesting new form of expression. You know this poetry? Mary, I, don't, I, don't know this, I don't know if this is really qualifies as really poetry, but Mary had a little lamb. His face was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went. I don't even know what else it says. The lamb was sure to go. It's got a certain tone to it. It's got a certain pattern to it. You can recognize it as a poem, it has a certain beat to it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. It has a pattern to it. If you read Shakespeare's writing, I think it's called Iambic Pentameter. It has a certain pattern to it. You can analyze it, you can break it down, and you can mimic it. Because it was designed by a human being. The human mind can analyze it, understand it, and after centuries, not even over a millennium, centuries, even a few years actually, you'll be able to study it and understand exactly how to mimic it. But the Qur'an is written in a structure that is so easy to memorize, so easy to understand. And the greatest linguistic scholars of all time have analyzed it, and I've studied with them, not the greatest scholars, but some really good scholars, and they have they've explained these things to me. And it's very clear how it all functions. We know exactly what the Qur'an is, what it is. We know all the rules, exactly what its word was here, this accent was there. We know why everything fits. We know exactly all the rules related to it. But it's impossible to mimic it. How do I prove this? Because people can say, well, how do you know somebody might not one day will design a great computer? In summary, it goes down to looking at the source of where the Qur'an came from. The Qur'an could have only come from four possible sources. It could have, now, I want you to imagine the globe during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a dot, and the arrows are a circle around him, and then you have the rest of all of mankind filling the earth. So it could have come from the non-Arabs, the rest of the planet. It could have come from the Arabs, the little circle around the Rasulullah It could have come from Muhammad Sallallahu He could have written it, he's a dot. And it could have come from outside of the planet, from Allah Azza wa Jal. It could not have come from the non-Arabs, that's an obvious one, because that's like me writing the world's greatest Japanese 500-page literature, even though I don't even speak Japanese. It's not going to happen. It's not from the non-Arabs, so we can scratch them out. And all we have left is the circle around the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Could it be the Arabs? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَتْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهُ النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَ وَعِدَّةُ الْكَافِرِينَ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, if you have any doubt whatsoever in this message, send down to our Prophet, then come with one chapter. People say, I and so on, it's all wrong. The small, it started with, come with the book, then it said, come with ten chapters, and the smallest challenge to the greatest Arab linguist of all time. Come with one single chapter. And what's the smallest chapter? Surah al -Kawfa. And if you fail, and when you fail to come with something like it, then fear the hellfire that is kept alight 
by stones and humans, prepared for anyone who disbelieves. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us that it's impossible for, he brought the, the, the challenge down to Surah Al-Kawthar. Inna a'tainak al-kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shani'aka huwa al-abta. Ten words. Mary had a little lamb is about double that. Okay? Ten words is the simplest, it's such a tiny, three words, three words and four words in a little tiny piece of writing. All you gotta do is write something in the same style as that. And you've proven that this cannot possibly be from the Creator because it says, You will never be able to match it. You'll never be able to figure out how to write something like this. This one sister I know who is a convert, she said that when she read this verse, she said that whoever wrote this book just shot himself in the foot, if it was a human being. Because you just open the doors to people right away, at, right away ridiculing you. And look at what happened to Paul Sarasad. He was threatening to take everything away from Quraysh. They told him, we'll make you our ruler. We'll give you our women. We'll give you our wealth. We'll give you doctors, if that's what you need. Just stop what you're doing. And all they would have to do is say, well, we're the greatest Arab linguists of all time. Write something like it. None of them even could even dare come up and speak. And the, you think about why. Imagine that this is a conference for the greatest scientific minds in molecular biology. And I, ha I personally have, I don't know what I'm talking about with molecular biology. Let's say I stand up here, and you guys are all like some of the foremost scientists in the field. And I'm going to come and teach you something mind-blowing about molecular research. You're going to look at me and just mock me out of the room. And that's how the Arabs were. They knew if they dared stand up in front of this Quran, they would be humiliated. Five minutes, that's what it says. <laughs> so we know the Arabs had no chance. They never even were even able to come even close to even attempting the possibility. Even the biggest enemies of Islam, such as Al-Walid ibn Mughira and others, they said that this book is the height of eloquence and nothing will ever reach it. These are just believers and they said this about it. We know the Qur'an is absolutely from the Creator because, he, because the Qur'an breaks one very simple rule, which is that we as human beings are the masters of language. And we as human beings can't figure this book out. It's beyond us. It's impossible. Think about this. Ten billion plus Qur'ans in this world. What other book on this earth would be able to have lasted this long? If the Qur'an could have been changed, even one accent in it could have been changed. Oh, you would have seen edits and edits, and everybody would have had a version and versions and versions, and the word jihad would have been removed a long time ago. Four wives would have been removed, that's for sure, a long time ago. Everything would have been interpreted, not four wives, you're going to have four, uh, you know, uh, children. What is that? <laughs> have one, two, three, or four children. No, not two or three or four wives. Lots of things would have been removed from the Quran because of popular public opinion. That's why other books were changed, because they didn't match what everyone believed in at the time. There's other things as well. I'm not, again, there's so much to talk about with these topics, but one, one very interesting thing that many of you may already know is that when Allah Azza wa revealed the Qur'an, He revealed it obviously in chronological order, based on events that took place. At the end of the Prophet ﷺ's life, Jibreel السلام, came down three times and restructured the whole entire Qur'an into the revelation format, the revelation order. So we have two orders, chronological and revelation. It was done during the time of the Prophet ﷺ during his life, and it was completed during that time. What kind of a mastermind could possibly have put a book together over 24 years without making a single grammatical mistake the entire time? Not one. Anybody who's ever done copy editing, we all know, no human being can write something without editing and, and, and editing and fixing mistakes and fixing mistakes, no matter how great or linguist you are. One edit, one writing, the whole 24 years, and at the end of his life, he takes the world's greatest writing that nobody can even come close to matching, and he mix it, not mixing chapters, mixing verses within a chapter. Mixing it all up, and presenting it in a matter of a very short period of time, and it's just as flawless the first time as it is in the final version. We know this book is not from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'll finish that point off, is because actually there's something very interesting, something somebody pointed out to me many years ago, which is that you have the books of Ahadith, something like 600,000 Ahadith, about 100,000 100, or so of them are Sahih. You put those ahadith next to the Qur'an and you look at the source of these two books. You can tell they come from two different personalities, 
two different sources. They're not from the same person. Anybody who works in copy editing or has published, you know you can't hide your personality from your writing. You've had people like, like um, Stephen King and other writers who wrote under different names, and everyone could, not everyone, but a lot of people who are especially experts in the field, you can right away tell. He wrote this book, because this is his style, because you can't get away from who you are and what you were raised doing. It is impossible for Muhammad to have done this for that reason, because we can clearly see from the ahadith there are two different sources. And the second thing is, Muhammad is a human being, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he could do it, somebody could analyze it and do the same, because the mind works the exact same way across the board. No matter how big a genius is, we can always figure it out. But it's still a choice to accept this or to reject this. And never forget that. That's why, وَمَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا الْبَلَى You're only here to explain these things. لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطَرِ You're not here to force. You're not here to grab somebody by the throat. Like, you must accept right now. You explain things and you let them go. The thing about the truth, it doesn't matter how long you run from it, you will always end up at it. You, all you can, that's, by the way, you know what kufr is? You all know what kufr is. Kufr, linguistically, is to cover something up. When you tell somebody the truth, it will remain with them for the rest of their lives because the mind is designed to only accept truth. Now, of course, you can accept lies, but it's designed to accept truth. So once you give it that truth, that it knows is true, it's stuck there forever. All you can do is cover it up and put it into a corner, and that's kufr. And that's the truth of the Islamic Hafidah. This leads us to certainty. We know there's a creator, and we know this message, this Qur'an, is the final message and guide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should have the same effect, remember the gas example? It should make you get up and be afraid, because you are going to face him. He is going to account to you, and me. And we're going to be horrified on that day of our, what, what we did ourselves with our own two hands. He warned us. He told us you're going to be accounted. He told us, try your best. He told us he's the most forgiving, but he said, Toba is not for the person who lives his whole entire life doing whatever he wants and right before death reaches him. He says that, now I've repented. That is not how it works. It's a very, life is not a game, it's not a joke. It's a very serious place. It's the most serious test imaginable. And the consequences are the actual outer extremities of any possible punishment reward system. Heaven is the reward of everything a human body could possibly want. It says time's up. I just want to keep you all filled in the secret letter that I'm getting. And the outer extreme is the hellfire. We have a giant fireball floating above our heads, constantly reminding us what heat, what a lot of heat will do. Now imagine being burnt and not being allowed to die. Imagine being burnt and not allowing, not being allowed for that flesh to disappear. It just keeps on coming back. The nerves keep on regrowing. It's a very, very serious threat. And it's there to motivate you. Because if you weren't told this, if you were told it's being in a state of being without God, that's a hellfire. Not a very strong motivation to control yourself. And, and not just pray your five times a day, but look into Hakam Shari before you take an action. It's not just a matter of just doing whatever Hakam comes to you. Ask before you do things. What does Allah tell me? And of course it helps us carry this da'wah with certainty. You can go to people and say that this really is the truth. It absolutely is the truth. And you must at least give it a chance. At least look into it. SubhanAllah, <laughs> Rabbi, 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 Rab